now we are on the on the record. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, let me start. So I'm uh, Matthias Rodman. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this tool called FQ that I've been working on for the last maybe one and a half years. Uh, is the volume good, by the way? It's yes, it's, it's, it's good. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, the first time I give a talk about this tool, uh, I have demoed it before, but not any presentation. So I hope the presentation will make sense. Uh, and I will divide the, the presentation into some background and history and like why it was created, why I need it. And then, <clears throat> then a short uh, introduction to JQ, what you kind of needed to know what JQ is and the language that I choose to use, because it's kind of fundamental to FQ. And then a bit like how it differs, how JQ and FQ differs and how to use FQ. Uh, and I will also go through some implementation details that might be interesting or interesting uh, ways that FQ is implemented. And also a bit like how to write decoders and uh, how the DSL works. And maybe some also about uh, the current state of FQ and uh, where I see it go in the future. Uh, and then a demo. So, let's see. To the next slide. So the background is that uh, in my free time and at work, I dig around in a lot of uh, binary files. At work, mostly media files like uh, MP4, JPEGs with pictures and things. And and uh, the uh, the reason why I ended up needing this was that uh, I see a lot of broken files in my work. Uh, so uh, it's hard to know sometimes if the if this is a bug in the software or if it's the file is just corrupt or if it's just weirdly if it's the bug in an encoder a bug in a decoder. So I've used over the years I've used all these tools like FF Probe, Graphic Magic, Identify, and for just like all these kinds of tools for like extracting uh, metadata and other information about them, and then also used a lot of tools for like sorting and filtering out and do all kinds of things with the data out from the binary files. Uh, and I also use this uh, like the you known hex fiend for example I used a lot and hex dump and of course DD and chat and all the other some other hex editors also. Uh, and I also use JQ extensively to to, that has been like the go-to tool when you once you have the data in some kind of format, usually you end up with JSON and then you can like combine JSON from several tools and do queries over. So I, I, knew, I knew that JQ was very <laughs> uh, useful or could solve these kind of problems. Uh, so I had a wish list and a joke that I wanted a tool that could like see to my colleagues once that uh, I want a tool that can like show me everything about this image file or this picture except the actual picture. I mean, I want to see everything a normal user would not like to see. And it like, should be like, uh, and I was kind of inspired, inspired by this file tool. You know, this file, you can just write file and it uses this magic database to find, figure out what it is. So I was like, I want to have a tool where I can just run this tool on this file and just automatically figure out what it is and just dumps more or less everything. And I also want it like it's some kind of like a GDB debugger for files. And I also wanted some kind of way of selecting like parts of a file and also do and ideally do queries over it. Like to make all the whole files uh, like symbolically addressable kind of. Like everything should be should be able to see what it is, like what, what, what part that you can, you should be able to say at any bit here, what part of the, which symbol is this? And I, of course I need, I wanted some kind of a DSL or something to, to express these kind of decoders. Uh, let's see. 
And of course, I, I wanted some kind of CLA, CLI tool for doing this. So I have had used uh, Hexfin, but the problem with Hexfin is that it's a macOS only program. And it has a very nice UI for, for like searching and poking around in files, but it's not like a, it's too much clicking around and things if you want to, to do things. And you can't do any queries or anything. Yeah, so I started experimenting uh, to write uh, in what language to write the coders. So I tried TCL because uh, Hexfiend uh, uses uh, TCL for it's like it's called binary templates in Hexfiend. And so I wrote my own like text fiend, which is a was like a CLI version of Hexfiend. It was kind of a hack, but it worked. But it turned out that TSL, TCL is just way too slow to do. It's like the calling back and forth between uh, like this uh, boundary, API boundary between different languages. It's just too slow to do the coding. Right? So I did a lot of tests with Lisp, also too slow. Tango, which is like a scripted version of Go, also too slow. And Starlock and JavaScript and, and maybe and Go I tried last. And Starlock is a Python version and JavaScript, I guess everyone knows. And the problem with using these DSLs was that they, at least Starlock have, uh, or Python doesn't have, uh, it was hard to express kind of a DSL with Python. It has lambdas, but it was, it become very awkward. And it also was kind of slow to do back and forth. And uh, I also experimented with different query languages. Like, should it be, what, how should you select things and do queries? And I, so I, I even wrote my own. Uh, JQ-ish JSON path language, which was very hacky, but it, it kind of worked. And I even tried SQL through SQLite that you kind of get the code and then you dumped it into SQL more or less, and then you used SQL commands. But the problem with SQL is that it's like a relation and how do you express three structures in SQL? It's, it was very awkward. And I even went the way of uh, trying to make uh, uh, FQ, like a tool that dumped into some kind of intermediate representation JSON, and then you use CQ to do the filtering and then back into, into FQ again. I mean, it, you could do it and had some prototypes for doing it, but it just was very awkward to use. Uh, so the best, uh, best would be if I could use a decoder and the query language would be in the, in the same tool. It's just one tool. Because I also talked, was thinking about like maybe extending hex theme, for example, with the external the decoders to make it faster. Uh, so the result was that I chose to go with Go. Uh, and the reason was that I did some, I wrote some tests in Go to figure out like how, how fast can we make this. And it, and Go is, was fast enough to, do, to decode like big flag files, for example. And I also found uh, Go JQ, which was kind of a, that's probably the biggest reason, because then it was like, after Pope, like, experiment with the Go JQ, because it, it, it lacked some features that I needed, but I, I, I looked at the code and it was very well nicely written. So I figured out that I can probably add the things I need here. Uh, and it also turns out that uh, decoding in the way that FQ does is that it's not really, you would maybe think that in the that uh, decoding will be the bottleneck would be like the, the actually reading the bits and decoding things, but a tool like FQ also keeps track of so much data, like all the bit ranges, all the decoded values. So it actually allocates a lot of memory, like very small amounts and a lot. So it turns out that like a memory allocation is is probably at the moment the biggest. Uh, uh, performance factor for FQ. I can talk about later about the future, how to fix that, or ideas on how to fix that. So I, I also written a lot of Go before, so I, I really like uh, it's a very nice, a lot of good tooling. It builds fast, and uh, uh, it's very nice for doing CLI tools. So let's talk a bit about the JQ. Uh, so, I guess most people have used AQ in some way. 
uh, it's a yoke, a yoke that is uh, this, uh, the JSON indenter. I also use this for identity, ident indenting J uh, JSON for a while until I realized that it's actually more than just the uh, indenter, it's actually a whole language. Um, you can say that it's like a language that has JSON as input and JSON as output, but the language itself is uh, looks like JSON, but it's not really JSON. In most practical cases, it is yes, it's, it is JSON, but there are some, some differences in how it parses numbers, and so it's not. So the syntax of JQ, the language is not entirely JSON. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a functional language that is based on generators and backtracking, which is a bit unique, I would say. I don't know many languages that are that we use generators as much as JQ. And that means that uh, a generator means that uh, an, uh, like every expression in JQ can return like zero, one or more values. And uh, when it returns zero values, like it, then it backtracks to the next generator. So that's how you implement loops, for example, in JQ, is that you you have an expression, a loop, like a okay, range expression, for example, that outputs uh, that many values, like every number between so 10 or something. Uh, and it doesn't have any, it doesn't have variables, but it has bindings. So you can have uh, something that looks like variables in a, in a tradition, like in, in, uh, in, uh, like in other languages. Uh, let's see, and it also has uh, implicit input and output values, and that is the reason why it can look like near like shell pipelines. Uh, so I, um, I will see that later how it looks, and uh, the, that it has like this. Uh, uh, it has even has a syntax with this comma operator for doing generators. I will demo that also, and that makes it very easy to do these combinatorical things and traversing and things. So, uh, let's see, let's do some examples. So here is basic literal AQ. And this uh, this uh, this is just uh, like a prompt. So you can imagine this being some uh, typing on like some kind of JQ shell. So if you do like one, two, three, it's just a number, strings, arrays, and here's an object. And here you see the first glimpse that uh, JQ is not really JSON. You can write like these kind of expressions and it, yeah, it sounds these numbers. And here you see this pipe, pipe operator, also called like filter in JQ. So here it takes the string hello, the length of hello is five, dot is the identity function, which just returns the implicit input, which is five here times two, so it's 10. And then you have the, here you have the comma operator, one comma two, so it outputs one and then outputs two to the next filter. So it's first it outputs one to the field to the next filter times two, which is two. Then it outputs two to the next field to the next filter and outputs four, so it's two times two. And it has uh, this index operator. So you can index into objects and to an arrays, and here you index into this array with one, two, three, at index one, which is two. Um, and it also has like a collect syntax, which means like everything inside square brackets will be collected into an array. So here we have the expression one, comma, empty, comma, two, and empty is a function in JQ that just returns nothing, so it just backtracks. So this expression will be an array with one and two. And then you have the iterator function and the iterator operator, which is that when you do square brackets without anything in between. So here we take the array one, two, three, iterates it and then collect it. So then we end up with just the same array again. And here's a more general, like how we do nested generators and backtracking. Here we can maybe, we don't have to go into the details and it has, uh, it, it has like conditionals, reductions for each. Here's like how you do the bindings. You can skip, I think you can skip this into the, you can read the slides yourself if you want. 
Um, we do like details. <laughs> details. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we can. Uh, uh, I can. Yeah, so the normal uh, conditions is just normal, like if if statements, like if something true, then else. It also has uh, else is actually optional in, in modern versions of JQuery, and then it's like you can have else if also. Uh, and if you don't, if you have, if you don't have else, it just returns the same value as it got in. And reductions are just like accumulators in functional languages. We just like you you accumulate some value, it sums all the these one two three returns six for each is is similar to reduce, but instead of uh, you're you're still accumulating, but then you have an additional uh, expression that is like what should be extracted in each loop. And then you get an output for each of those instead. And uh, the binding syntax is that you write something s and then dollar and the name. And if you do it this way, the the implicit input value will actually just flow through all the way. But you don't, I don't use it here. But so here you just assign uh, one to a, two to b, and then you just sum them. And uh, you can also have functions in JQ. So here we showed the, here is the, the map function from this. This, this is actually the, the definition from the standard library in JQ, how the map works. So how you do is that you have a, you can have arguments to function in JQ. And if you don't, if you just write it like this, the function would actually be a, like a lambda. So it will be like another JQ express or the JQ, another JQ program or filter. So this filter is defined as it takes a filter F, uh, it collects, and then it iterates the input it gets, and then it filters through F each each value it gets, it filters through F and collects the values. So if you do the array one, two, three, map it with the times two, and uh, you get yeah, two, four, six. And this shows how the uh, the select function works in the standard library, which is like it just takes an F, some kind of a filter, and it's defined as if the F is true or true ish, not null or false, I think it's true uh, in JQ, then it just returns dot, which is like the same value again, or it returns empty, which like it returns no value. And if you do want to the array one to three, and then we use map from up here and select, and you select all the values that are even, then you get the array back with those two. And you can also write recursive, recursive functions to output more than one value. So this is a function that returns like all the values from whatever input you give it to, to zero. So you see it just uses n and then comma and then recursive the course itself. And this is how uh, some of the standard library function in JQ is implemented. Because it, it has uh, tail recursion optimization, so it can do this kind of things. So in yeah. the first in the first example, yes. to the map function, mm -hmm. the argument f yes. um, is not actually a function, is it? Uh, it's, a, it's a function that uh, has test. It, it only takes uh, the implicit input and it gives it output. It can't take any arguments. Yeah, but my point is that when you are calling that map function and you are passing dot uh, mm -hmm. times two, yeah, the dot times two gets evaluated or not? No, no, it gets evaluated here. Okay, and that is that depends on context. Yes, exactly. So map is a special context, or that is a gener the general way how passing arguments to functions work in JQ? Yeah, if you, there is, a, oh, here you see how you pass, you can pass like a binding instead. Oh, I see. Okay. But, uh, it is very, it can be a bit confusing in the beginning to, to, to because they also behave very similar in most functions. So if you, so if you define the, the, the formal argument with a dollar, Mm -hmm. Then when you call the function, then you are forcing the valuation of the argument. Yes, exactly. Of the actual argument. Okay. Yeah, so okay. Then it happens at the call site instead. Like okay, I was confused happen. by that F name, you know, I was like, well. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, is, yeah. it is probably one of the most confusing things in, F, in JQ. Okay, thank you. So let's talk about FQ. 
so FQ is uh, uh, the binary indenter. Uh, it's like a, it, it is supposed to be a superset of JQ. So it is it should be able to do anything that JQ can do. Uh, and it uh, I have re-implemented nearly all of the the CLI of JQ. So you can use it from the CLI prompt. It's, it should be, behave the same. There are some some things that JQ can do that is like JSON specific that doesn't really fit into a binary. Like JQ can read like uh, many JSON fragments from a file individually, which doesn't really make sense in the binary world. world. Uh, and it has uh, many input formats. So it currently has 83 input formats. I think maybe it's even 84 now. And uh, 22 of those are probable. Like, like they can automatically like figure out if the input is in a certain format. So you don't have to specify it yourself. And it also has uh, some additional standard library functions, like more generic ones that is like to work with arrays or some other things that are not not really FQ specific. Uh, that I think is useful. That like JQ is missing. It's, it's very nice to you can I will actually show some of them. And then FQ has uh, two additional types. That is probably the the biggest difference between JQ is that it has these two types called the code value and binary. Uh, and they, 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 if you use normal JQ expressions, they will, they will behave as normal uh, JQ values. So for, for, from JQ's perspective, they are just like strings or numbers or arrays or objects. This is to make everything like, uh, make the standard library of JQ work with, uh, with these binary structures. Uh, but uh, as I will show later, you can do some. There are some special functions that uh, you can use to reveal this that they are, they are not actually what they actually are. And also, FQ has uh, output like like it can output not only JSON. It can also output in some kind of fancy hex dump format, uh, and it can also output binary like the just raw binary data. Uh, and it also has a, an interactive REPL with the completion and, and sub REPL support. Uh, so this show maybe this is a bit hard to, to read. Uh, this shows all the formats in JQ because the, the they have like uh, they read how they work. A format can kind of use another format, so you there is a dependency graph between all the formats. They don't know about the implementation of each other, but they know about uh, like the name of other formats. So here you can see that uh, this is the probe group. Uh, maybe it's a detail also that there are groups of the formats. Uh, so you can see that the probe group has, uh, I guess it's hard to see, but here it, I think it's Matroska and this is MP4. So you can see that MP4 is part, part of the probe group. And then MP4 has uh, of other formats. It is probably AVC frames or MP3 frames or whatnot, which goes down to other, and then you see how they are connected. Uh, so this is how you use FQ, and it's the same as uh, JQ that you gave it uh, one expression and then multiple files, and then the, it would run. Uh, like it, it will evaluate expression for each input. That's how JQ works also. So you can do things like you can, uh, for example, this expression will find all the exif formats inside other file in, inside our JPEGs. So this will actually find all the exif inside all the JPEGs and JPEGs, PNGs and JPEGs in this directory. And uh, you can also, if you use D, which is a display function, I will show that later also how it works. So it's an A for display. So this will show like this fancy hex output for the tens, index 10 frame in this MP3 file. Uh, and you can also write expressions that return like an array. So this will find the, the DNS format, find the, the, all the name, uh, question names 
in this uh, this is a pcap for example you could, you could do this to dump all dump more or less the names of all the dns requests in this pcap um, and also you can use this uh, two bytes and two bits uh, to get binary data so this is a thing that finds the first jpeg uh, converts it into bytes and then uh, and then pipes it out to a jpeg file this would end up in the jpeg that you can use uh, and the interactive grapple is that you just do dash i and then you will end up in a shell so sorry what does grip byte return and this one yeah uh, it it depends a bit depends so this is a filter that is inside here it is like the f in the map so grip by is a function that recursively goes through a tree structure and evaluates this. So this it, it will be whatever this finds, but if you use format equal JPEG, it means that there has been an implicit input here that wasn't there was a display, was a decode value that you can run format on that return JPEG. So out from here to 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 two bytes there will be a decode value. But is grab by a generator or it returns a collection of, of things? Uh, it's a generator. Ah, and first, what is first? It runs the generator and it, it gets uh, the first value and ignores the rest, or yes, exactly. So it's like okay, it okay. the generator and just takes the first one. Okay, I was curious why you was not using indexing there, but yeah, it makes full sense. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's beautiful, eh? Yeah. yeah. Of course, I guess that first does not execute the generator more than once, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, we can skip this one. It's maybe uh, we will see how this is. It shows this different outputs. Uh, the display like fancy fancy hex dump, uh, JSON values, and this is how you dump out the PNG. And then you file to see that it actually is a PNG, and then the interactive shell. But I will show the demo will show this. So, um, and then let's see, I have to scroll. And uh, yeah, here you see some of the like generic, some of the additional generic functions that FQ adds. It has this like streak, count, delta, chunk, diff. It's like all the things you need when you with a lot of like maybe you have a, uh, like I will show in the demo that in the in MP4 file you have like these sample size tables or chunk offset tables, and you you want to maybe know like what is the uh, what values are there? How many similar values are there? What are the deltas? What are the unique number of counts? So these, these, all these functions are are helpers for doing things like that. And I also have a lot of like this function for converting between different uh, number bases and convert from and to and from hex and the base sixty four and other kinds of encodings. And then you have this uh, a display value, a decode value specific function that is like this display. But you usually don't write display, you just use D, for example, which is display, and DV is display variables, and DA, which is display all. Because default, I don't show a long array, so I just truncate them, because it would be, if you work with very big files, it will, it will just output forever. And also, the code values have some special things that you can you can run the fun parent function, then you will get the parent, the code value. Uh, this, is you you can't really do this with JSON and uh, JQ can't do this, but uh, FQ can because it's like a read-only structure anyway. So you can refer back to parents and things. Uh, and it has these two value two actual. Uh, you will see this, uh, and then it also has some support for. It also overloads some of the JQ standard library functions for regex and things. So you can do uh, like. Uh, regex with binary using test match and some other things and also all the all the format decoders exist as a normal jq functions so you can run like probe is a function that just decode tries to decode all the probe formats and run like mp4 frame and it will try to decode whatever input it gets at mp2 as an mp3 frame uh, it also has support for binary arrays uh, this is very similar to uh, to IO lists in Erlang. If you have used Erlang, it's like a, it's just a it's uh, it's just a list or an array in this case. 
with uh, uh, with either numbers, strings, or other or the code values or other binaries or other binary arrays. And you can, if you if you use only these types in these arrays, they can act as they were a binary, a, con a concatenated binary. This is very useful to to uh, yeah, okay, show some examples of it. Uh, yeah, and this is all the function you can use to, to create binaries. You can use this two bits, two bytes, two. And it's a, the reason why there is the two bits and two bits is that if you use two bits, you will get a binary that is at, uh, that uses bit units. So you can, when you do indexing, you do actually indexing each bit. And if you do two bytes, so you're indexing on, on bytes and stuff. And then there is some, it's a bit hard to explain that you have this byte range that is the way to uh, preserve the the range from where the binary came from. It can be used for I, I, it's a bit detailed. Uh, and you can turn like any decode value into binary by doing just pipe it to two bytes. And you can con convert like a string to two bits or whatever you want. And if you do a string you will get uh, the UTF eight code point bytes. And this is how you create a, a binary array. You just you just put things in in a numbers will be bytes automatically. Uh, so it's an error to put values number values that are above two hundred and fifty five or below or negative, and you can put like the code values inside here also because they are also binaries. So this will kind of concatenate all of this if you do two bytes. Uh, and if you don't, if you uh, this is implemented internally in FQ in a, like efficient so it doesn't really copy things so it's, uh, it will it will just have references to all these things and uh, you can also slice uh, binaries just using normal size syntax in jq so this will take the text hello convert it to bits and then you say i want to have the bits from bit 8 to 8 plus 16 so this will be the it will not be the string el but it will, it will be the, the bits for el or the utf8 code points which is bytes because, yeah because it's asking uh, and you can also decode the binary arrays so you can just put whatever you want and then pipe it to a decoder so that i've used that a lot to uh, like for example i had a bug in a flak decoder once that uh, uh, it seemed like the there was it, it, it like uh, found a, a flag frame in the end of the file which it shouldn't. It turns out that uh, it was actually decoding outside the uh, ring buffer, so the the, the flag decoder didn't know that the file actually ended. So it actually decoded beyond the file because the the frame buff or the, the ring buffer just padded in zeros. So it, I tried this in FQ by just taking the last. 10 bits and just paired it with the zero bits and then gave it to the flag and it actually decoded as a with correct checksums and things. Uh, and this is just some example. We can skip skip this, I think, if we are running out of time. Yeah, I will demo most of these things anyway. And you can also use FQ as a script interpreter. So this is just you just used as a yeah, shebang thing. Uh, and this is a script that takes an mp4 file and then uh, this is very mp4 specific for it. it just finds all the move boxes and uh, do something with it and it also shows that uh, jq actually has support for uh, pattern bindings pattern matching bindings so you can you can actually use this as which is a way to put uh, bindings in values hello yes You have a question? Oh, okay. Uh, so this will actually produce an array and then you can just ask to assign all the, so this will like, uh, this variable will be index zero, one index two. So it, it can, it's just a shorthand for things. So it is the same as pattern matching in functional languages. Uh, so if you run this on an MP4 file, for example, then it will output to JSON like this. Uh, so, how is JQ or FQ implemented? 
So the FQ is actually implemented as a bunch of uh, uh, functions in Go that are exposed as JQ functions. So it, it, it so it adds a lot of like ability to the to the JQ language. At least like these decoders, the code value, like these binary types, a bit reader, some IO things, and then some TT like terminal things to know how big the terminal is and things. And you can a very, very simplified version of FQ is that it is kind of like this. Uh, it just opens the file, it decodes it. If it's a REPL mode, it just uh, ends up drumming a function that's called repeat, which is just repeats the same uh, filter over and over again, which is like read from the prompt. I save that as, as expression, type it into eval, and then the implicit input that will be the code, the value from the code. And then just print the value and repeat. And if you if you're not in REPL mode, it just evaluates the argument and prints it. So that uh, nowadays the, the code in the AQ is a lot more complicated than this. But in the you can see traces of this in the AQ code. And uh, all the code, all the current codes is in Go. And uh, it uses the uh, like it uses currently uses the fork, forked version of Go EQ. and it uh, I have I have upstreamed and helped to implement a lot of things in Go EQ. Like uh, native functions were not supported when I started using EQ. so I helped adding that, and then also helped adding uh, iterators, native iterators. Like you can implement an iterator in Go. Uh, and it also has the JQ value interface, which is a, a Go interface that's called JQ, JQ value, which is the this magic that makes uh, the code values and binaries and thing work. Because you then any Go type can kind of implement and behave as a, as a JQ value. And I also added some kind of more for reflection and uh, some query parsing and marshalling and AST things to do completion and the query rewrites for the REPL. Uh, yeah. The decode API so this is uh, how the decode API works in Go. Uh, so this is a decoder that decodes this SPS, which is like a, I don't remember what it is, it's like sequential picture something in H264. This is a very compact thing for the code, for encoding something about the HDR parameters. But it looks like this. Uh, it adds a field that is uh, uh, some kind of uh, unsigned integer. Fn means that it will use like a custom reader. This is the name of the field, and this is the reader, which is some kind of Coulomb something reader that you have a custom. And I haven't shown it here. And then you can have a uh, zero or more uh, scalar mappers, I call them, which is like a way of manipulate the the value that was read. This is the how you do like uh, mapping between numbers to strings and whatever you want to do. And then you can see that it reads four bytes. Uh, so this is how you do when you just want you don't have any special decoders. You can just say that add uh, the field called bitrate scale that is an unsigned four bit integer and one more and then. Here is an array. It is an array of structures that is, has this uh, also custom decoders, and there's just the bool reader. And this is uh, so. If you look at the specification in the H264 specification, uh, the specification looks like this. So it's uh, very close to how the specifications look like. And then there, uh, I mean, it's intentional that I did it this way. Uh, and this is how the MP3 decoder works in FQ, uh, like a simplified version. So the MP3 decode in FQ actually uses more or less just uses other decoders. So there's an MP3 train decoder, and there are decoders for the header formats in MP3. So this header group, I don't show it here, but uh, in the MP3 decoder, it kind of registers saying, I want to have a group called header group. And in that group, I want to have uh, AD, like IDT V1 and IDT V2 and some other ones. And then uh, you can just uh, 
like iterate, just iterate and decode as many headers as you can. I don't show here how I actually break out of this, but it's not so important. And then once it has decoded all the headers, it goes, creates an array called frames, and then it tries to decode as many MP3 decoders, as the MP3 frames as it can. And then when then it's not possible, it goes to the code footers and then it's done. Uh, so the future is that uh, maybe the most uh, thing I want to do, the biggest thing I would like to do is to support some kind of declarative decoding, uh, like Kai type struct is probably the closest, and that is to like in runtime uh, read some kind of uh, declarative decoding description and the code. So you can have, you, you don't have to write Go code to, to write the code anymore. And this will probably be the code, be implemented in JQ as a, just a normal decoder that's called Gaikai that can take some special arguments. And it will just use the same APIs as the normal decoders. Uh, and I also want to do more like uh, do something about checksums. It can do some kind of checksum now, but it's a bit weird how to, how to handle like uh, the calculated and then the, the actual decode uh, checksums and also maybe record what kind of encodings that were used, some kind of validations maybe you want. And also I would like to do some kind of schema support for on and put the buff. Currently they just decode them, uh, but you don't get any names or anything because there's no schema. So it would be nice to be able to provide schemas when you decode. And uh, it I have some ideas on how to support modification of data, but it won't be, a, it won't, it will probably not be that you can just assign things like in JQ, because it's a, it's, it's a very complicated topic <laughs> to, to change this kind of like, well, what do you do when you do a remux formats and what do you do with checksum and links fields and things like it's, it's uh, hard to know. And maybe the most complicated things to do with this is like to, what does it mean to do a modification? So it's hard to communicate to the user of this, but what, does, what do you actually do when you change something? So I think for FQ, I would like at least support some kind of help to do this kind of slicing. So you don't, so it can help with uh, how to uh, uh, concatenate together things into, so you can, it nearly looks like you are changing the value, but it's not actually. Uh, Maybe I will start looking to encoders, I don't know. But that will be like a separate thing. It will be maybe a decoder, some of the decoders can decode into a format that the encoder can input. But it will be probably a very specific format that it will support the encode. And I guess I will maybe look into a lazy decoding. This is to just to save memory. So you, you only decode once you need to decode. But that you can only do this in some formats where it has length fields. That is like the, where the data is framed, so you know how big things are. Otherwise, you can't really know where things are, so you have to decode. But maybe you can decode and then throw away things and just, just save the, the ranges instead. And I guess some kind of UI, UI would be, some kind of interface would be nice. And also streaming input, I don't know, reading, in, reading from network. And uh, it would be nice to have more contributors. Uh, I have gotten some, two other decoders are written by other people, but it's a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit, little bit of one man band at the moment. FQ. <laughs> so that was uh, all the slides. Uh, and I want to think, thank this, uh, I know I can probably pronounce his name, Ichni, for GoJQ. He has been very helpful and uh, I don't know how many, I probably submit like 40 or 50 issues and pull requests to his project. And he has been always been very helpful and uh, uh, had good ideas. And also Stefan for uh, JQ, but he's not very active in JQ community and at the moment or haven't been for many years, but still <laughs> very, uh, very, very thankful for him. And also Hexfield, like Gnu Poke and Kai, all of these, all of these projects have, have, have inspired a lot of things. And uh, if you want to roll, write a lot of JQ, I can recommend this uh, Wish of Code extension that I, it's, it's my 
extension I've written a language server for JQ also. So you can do like uh, completion of some other things. Uh, syntax checking. So that was all the present slides. Uh, I wonder if there was. Uh, yes, so let's do a demo. Do this. Oh, can you see? Yes. Right. So let's see. So I have prepared some files here, like a good binary chef. So if you, yeah, you can just run F. If you run FQ, it just show it just says like uh, news an expression and a bunch of files or you can do that just on the do some example queries uh, and all of these are more or less the same as JQ. Uh, and let's see you can go into an interactive prompt if you do just this it will just give you a null input which is just a one null so you can if you do dot dot here you see it's just a, it will give you one uh, one input so it's like a, a, the input is just a generated it just returns now so here you can just type things if you want and you can also do uh, things like sub -repl. so now i created a sub -repl that is that takes the generator one two three so it will be three values so you can do here you can write things like this and we can show i can show somehow like uh oh, i have cut and pasted some things here uh, so this is uh, a binary array it takes these bits or it takes these numbers turns them into so it filters through uh, two bits two bytes and two strings so then we get so this is the the, the bits for the string fq so you can do things like this uh, let's uh, open uh, this is a uh, file and you can do like this and then you see now now the the, the term is quite uh, uh, it's not very big so you, it ends up being yet it's looking a little weird here uh, so you can do a dot and dot is just the code value, so it will just show this fancy hex. But it will it's the only it will only show one. It will only show the root uh, values when you do this. So here you can do like uh, you can use completion here. I'll show you the like the first box. You can just automatically because it's a function language, so it will actually just evaluate things and figure out what keys there are and whatever it is. Um, see and you can let's say let's say that you want to find the uh, oh i prepared it <laughs> and so this for example is a uh, it finds the the sample size box which is called stsc in mp4 so now there are there are four of these um, sample size boxes so there's four tracks in this mp4 file so you can do this if you only want the first so, so now I did a sub repl with the first sample box. So you can do with this. So now you have the like the entries here. So you can just go entries. And here is the, it only shows the 51st. But we, we can let's say we do this. Uh, and then now I don't say. So if you do D A here, for example, you will see all of them. If you do D V, you will see even the ranges for all for each. Uh, for each entry and now you can do so you see that these these now are, are like uh, code values but you can do it because the code values behaves as normal your yeah, yeah, values you can do like you can run them in the function lengths for example you can do and it will show you that it's like 1095 entries you can add to sum them you can do uh, and divide by lengths so it's here to see the, the the average size if you want 
Yeah, so you can you can treat them, the decode values as if they were the AQ values. Uh, let's see. We can go back. I can show that you can. It's a function that counts the, so you, you get like pairs that is like this. Um, uh, this value was found one time. So then you can add something like that to sort, sort this array. It sorts by, by this value, the number of times. Then maybe. Here you see the first five most uh, common sample size for that track. And I actually prepared it so I don't have to write all of this. Um, and you can do, do some more lines. So you can use like a. But now I print in more like user friendly. So you can take like this expression now go out to the prompt here instead, and it will show you for that file. And what you can do it for all the before files is directory. And if you want, now we didn't print which file is which, you can just put, can put parentheses here. It's a function called input file in the AQ that you can use. Uh, let's see how much time do I have. Uh, I can maybe I can cut and paste this. Five minutes. Five minutes. Wish. Okay, so you can do uh, things like this, for example, uh, which is like a diffs. Uh, uh, so this is two MP4 files, and you, maybe you wanted to see what is the difference between the PPS structures. So you can well, here I define a function that finds the PPS function, and then you use the end to not read any inputs and then you use the diff function and give it the input so if the first input would be a small dot mp4 the next one will be the bar bunny and then it filters to f and then give it to diff and then the diff diff will uh, give you like a struct that is like a b where they and uh, you can also do things uh, like uh, A message pack file that, that can be probed. So you have to do this. I left you that this is a message pack. And you give it a file, and you can see here that it gives you like the bump of the message pack structure. But this is not, uh, I mean, it's nice for someone who is like implementing a message pack decoder or encoder or something. You can use this. Uh, to representation functions in the AQ or in FQ. And it will actually give you like a more like what what the value actually represents. And so then you can just continue on with normal AQ if you want to see. And I can show you how to do this. So, uh, Say you uh, the other the other day I was reading the FLAC specification and I saw that uh, this was like an example of the FLAC file in the specification. So I was like, how I would like to see what, what is this. Uh, so then you can, for example, do this. All of this and the FQ has a function called paste, which you can use to paste data into it. Uh, so this will paste and then start a sub repo with that. So you just paste it in here. We have the stream as a vector input. Uh, and then skip on the stream. And now there's an array of strings, so you have to do map. Uh, it a bit. Yes. Thank you. 
I'm writing a regex there to remove all the uh, like match all of this. And so now I remove all the white space and, and I can just add to like concatenate all these values. And then to hex, turns the text hex representation into binary. And now, now it's binary, so now I can just use the flag, type it to flag, and then type it to E. Please, we can do this. So, uh, also has support for this peak. Because inside this gzip there was a tar file with the pcap. <laughs> so inside here you can actually get all the TCP connections that are simply here. So now you can continue on here, whatever you want to do. Uh, I think that's all the notes I have. Uh, oh, it sounds and gave a good overview. And I hope people are interested enough to help out. There's a lot of things in FQ that uh, uh, doesn't make sense. And it's weird because like if you introduce a new type into a, or many types into a new, into an existing language, you get a lot of things that are uh, some expressions that are hard to, uh, to figure out what does it mean to index into this or so. Yeah, so there's a lot of things to do. I'm trying to figure out most things, but there are still very murky areas that behave strange. So thank you for listening and I hope it was interesting. Very much, very much interesting. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, we have time for questions, like yeah. a few minutes. Oh, sorry, I stopped. Oh, yeah. yeah, do we have any questions? If anyone wants to make a question, just activate the webcam or use the chat or whatever. Okay. Well, anyway, the summit is long, and probably people will mm -hmm. will have time to, you know, to think about all this. It's very nice. I have a couple yes. of things. I um, just wanted to uh, oh. thank you, Matthias. It was very cool project, really. It's mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, UI is very nice. Also, thanks for sharing this with us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's hard to know when you worked on something for a long time <laughs> yeah, you're you're inside your own bubble so maybe it's hard to explain what what is hard to understand no, it was very good presentation thanks thanks okay i have one comment uh, you mentioned that uh, about other languages that may you know use this uh, generalization of expressions as generators mm -hmm. and if you like this kind of languages you probably will enjoy uh icon icon ah, is it uh, is it Chris from ralph griswold apm no it's, it's called the icon okay. um it's from the 90s yeah it's uh and it's a language that i mean in icon every expression is actually a generator yeah. and all the control structures and everything in the language are tailored to that yeah. So I mean, you, uh, you will probably like it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's very confusing in the beginning if you haven't used it, before, but then uh, you get used to it, and then you realize this uh, uh, that you can. I didn't show so much here, but the, the, you realize so that you can. I mean, you can use uh, generate as an index, for example. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you realize that they're like, oh shit, I can use this anywhere in the language. So you can get very weird things like what happens if you have a 
uh, like in JQ, you have assignments. What happens if you have a generator on the left side of the assignment and you're assigning each? I mean, to be, can, yeah, yeah, it can become very complicated. Also. Yeah, but, but if you use them in a sensible, it's very, very nice. Look at icon, at icon because it's a very elegant little language. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if you don't mind, okay, in one minute, um, yeah. you mentioned at the introduction of your talk that you wanted to have something like GDB for files. What yeah. do you mean with that exactly? Because I guess I, the, the the REPL is the, the what I mean by that. I have like an interactive uh, shell to look around and. Uh, ah, okay, 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 okay. No, no, there is no breakpoints in. <laughs> yeah, that's what I you know. Like, well, yeah, man. And your UI is much better than GDB, really. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on the UI because I, I want I want it to be comfortable. I mean, I use it a lot, this tool, so. Well, we have to talk about your output, you know, when you, you are outputting the address and the binary dump mm -hmm. and the ASCII app dump and the field with the values, mm -hmm. we are going to steal that from you. Yeah, but you should. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> it, because I, I gave most, it a, a I try. Mean, I think I, st I stole it from Hex, Hexfiend, I guess that's, that's similar-ish things. But it would okay. be it would be nice if it was a. I mean, I have I've thought about doing an, a graphical interface to this. Then you could have like even collapse and maybe even have multiple interpreters running in different. I mean, it would be you could do a lot of things here. I think. Yes. Yes, definitely. Also, yeah, and and then I shut up the. I think you know when I was looking at the at those queries, I think you. I think FQ would be a super tool to test poke. Yeah. You know, to generate uh, 